Hi, I'm Seamless, and today is Saturday, which means an hour ago I should have uh, uh, was the limit of when I should have released the how to base, which is to say that I'm late. But what am I not? Anyway, I'm here to teach you how to make this sound. <laughs> How dope is that? Oh boy, uh, is this ever a thing? Although it's not really that much of a thing. Like, a couple of hot bases ago, I did an experiment where I engaged a whole bunch of FM and then I modulated independently all of the, the various volumes of the different operators to elicit sort of much more modulated change. And independent of that, I was reminded of, of an older how to base I, I did, a couple actually, but like mo it was still pretty old, but where I would, I would have a vocoded sound where I'd have a bass that's the vocoded, like, you know, the carrier, and then I'd modulate it with another synth. Like I would actually modulate it with a vocally sounding FME patch. And that was pretty powerful, of the course. And I thought about it and I was, well, what would happen if I combined two citruses that were doing this sort of FM cacophony business and you know, other stuff. And then a bunch of other things that things happen, like there's also post-modulation and they're doing and then key you know, compression or whatever. But that's the basic gist of what's happening. Um, and it looks complicated as hell, but really what it comes down to is that it's just a whole bunch of stuff being automated at one time, but very much of it is just like completely random. So let's talk about what that means by right, breaking us down into individual bits. So on top, we have this citrus that sounds like this. <laughs> Now, I forget if that's the carrier or the modulator. Let's see, it's going into input uh, one. It's the modulator. Okay, interesting. That's the modulator, anyway. So here's this guy. Now, uh, what's going on is that there's this there's this output, which, uh, so that this shape that you can get at, at inside Citrus, I'm just trying to get the smartest way to explain this. This is gonna be one of, a bummer for people who are using things like FM8 because they, this is part of, part of something that like only really Citrus can do. Well, that's not totally true. You could do this kind of thing inside uh, Serum just fine, but not with six oscillators all having each other. And so what it is, is that there's uh, various sort of shape-changing things you can do. This was a triangle wave, and then I, I did this. Now, there's actually like a very specific reason why I did that, like why I made that change happen. Like as much as a lot of it's random, like this particular one had a, had a purpose. The thing that I wanted out of there was that like if I, if I turn this into triangle wave, See the series of harmonics we get. The series of harmonics that the triangle wave has is pretty much the same series that a square wave has, just with slightly different phases. And actually, we can see this pretty clearly if we convert the harmonics and and add additively, where every side wave is representing a single harmonic in the series that creates a square wave. We can see that you know it's just these, these are the these are the harmonics, and then there's all oh, they're all in phase. This this this, call, this controls the phase of the harmonics, so it being empty means there's no phase change. And then if we go to a saw wave, we can see the different uh, harmonic series which is denser it's basically every harmonic is a saw wave and then every other harmonic is a square wave now a triangle wave as a series has the square series but it has alternate phases like not necessarily alternating but it's a very specific phase relationship that creates the shape that is the triangle wave however harmonically it's basically a low pass square wave um to that end i wanted square or saw wave harmonics out of this now there is a cool thing you can do with the shape change where if we start to do, if we do this to it, you see the, the saw wave harmonics come back. You might be asking, like, why didn't I just use a saw wave, or even why didn't I just do this? And now that I do the, both of them back to back, I'm starting to realize I should have just done this because uh, I didn't want the full harmonic series of the saw wave. I could have also just like pre-filtered it to still have those harmonics, really, because I just wanted those harmonics there to be FM by the other things. And that's why I did that. However, as it turns out, the, the effects of that are almost identical when using a triangle wave to just make sho shoving it in between a triangle wave and a saw wave. So yeah, good job me. But that's why I did that. Uh, the rest of these guys, like this guy being an octave higher, this usually means that it'll it'll generate uh, square wave harmonics out of whatever you out of whatever you're doing. However, it's getting it is then being modulated by something that is that is a fundamental tone. So that just that just goes out the window. And like this guy's also like a higher a higher you know pitch, but because there's waveforms that are at fundamental pitch, we don't we're, we're going to get solid harmonics out one way or the other. Now I absolutely didn't listen to any of these when I made made them like this. I just like just put them in there and like I avoided doing self oscillation, like feedback. 
just because um, I can get really hairy pretty fast. I mean, this can get pretty hairy pretty fast as well. And it is rather hairy. And I uh, automated the, the volume knob. Now, also in the database where I did the citrus, that was basically this, this whole process, what I did was I uh, made the automation clip so that the, the minimum value was at 50%. This is because this volume knob isn't zero to 100, it's 100 to a negative 100, and this is just zero in the middle. So what the whole point of that is that you can reverse the polarity of the waveform, which you can also do here. So you have the same range of control with this knob as you do with what you're doing in here, because that's what, that's what controls the intensity of FM. So how intensely operator two is operating on FM one is controlled by how loud it is, which is what this does, and this really just sets the upper limit of what that means, of what this whole thing means. And then, um, you know, how loud operator two is being modulated by operator three is controlled by how loud operator three is. And also how loud operator three is modulating operator one is controlled by how loud it is. You can see how there's an incredible amount of interplay between these various op op operators. Blah, operators. And that was the whole point of that original how to base, which was, let's see what a whole bunch of modulation does. So these first uh, six uh, automation clips are just rather um, five automation clips because I'm not automating the volume of the first one. They, there's just these guys' volumes. That's all that's happening. And, like, I changed... I just chose some... I just messed around with the waveforms. Like, I really wasn't trying super hard to, like, control it. And then, like, once I made the other one, I did the same thing. I didn't really want to screw with this very much just because, to, like, you know, changes to the primary components will alter alter it pretty drastically. And I kind of liked where it was going. I also involved Unison. Without Unison, this is what this sounds like. <laughs> And with you, this is what it sounds like. The distinction is slight, but it's there, and it also serves to, you know, pen a little bit so that we're not, you know, stuck in mono land. Put that in, in EQ. And because this is the modulator, this EQ is doing what, like, um, a lot of the previous Vocodex modulation stuff that I've done before, where um, you have a high-pass filter and then a whole bunch of holes in it. This is a technique that I came up with after being told to do it by Virtual Riot. So that's sort of why I know how to do that. Um, and then like this is basically what that sounds like without it. But like this this decision and and the, the effect that this has on the sound were created when I already had the rest of the chain already on, and I didn't I didn't you know I, like how it sounds now was not. Like I'm like okay cool that sounds good now I can now I can modulate something with it like it's not this is not a very it's not a linear process in the, of creation at all and it goes into Vocodex but before we talk about Vocodex let's go talk about the other guy because this is important so here's this dude now this guy came out a little bit more normal and the sort of path here is a little bit more normal. Now, this is actually just a clone of the original Citrus in terms of operators. All the operators are basically that, that basic idea, except this guy's a sine wave. The reason why this guy's a sine wave is because I'm using this as a sub out to be distorted against um, in the next next step here. And then operator 6 is actually the primary output oscillator. And you can see 6, six is being modulated by 5, then modulated by 4, by 3, by 2, by 1. This is a very direct chain of alteration. And then I'm automating the same parameters the same way I did the first one. So the next five uh, op operators, operator 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, are this guy here. Lots of weird stuff happens. This also has unison. Without unison, this is what this sounds like. Which is kind of cool. And then with unison, this is what it sounds like. You might be thinking to yourselves, but that one sounded way cooler. Why do we have this change to it? And that's because of what happens when it gets to the Vocodex, and that's when I made that decision. I didn't have Unison when I was first putting all this together. I put the Unison on after I already achieved like the Vocodex sound that I kind of wanted. And then it's also being distorted quite heavily. Now, this wave shape is, like, you might see me do this kind of thing sometimes. Um, the regular sort of just, like, bulbous, you know, uh, logarithmic shape is just you know basic saturation where it'll just distort it and make it louder that's you know that's what that's what it'll do now this whole business is serves to, to kind of add a little bit of um sort of high frequency chaos to it
Now, normally, this putting this here would uh, cause it to either like get a little, like chop off pretty hard or like become a much more saturated. But because of how loud this, like, the signal is and how consistent it is, it always interacts up, up, up here, which means it's always coming through at least some of it uh, past here. So it doesn't really like you know shut up too much. Like it would acquire a signal. This business, you saw how like when I really really accentuated that I get I got kind of like watery, and that. Um, is pretty similar to an effect that FM can have. Actually, if you do, there's a couple of things you could do with um, with wave shaping, where it'll it'll have that basic effect. Uh, doing it over here, like closer to the zero point, is interesting because it's referred to as crossover distortion, um, and it's something that tube amplifiers are known for, known for doing. If you look at this in the asymmetrical mode without changing anything, you can kind of see how like oh this is normal, this is normal, and then here's all this business, and then here's all this business that's normal. You can look at this as as sort of like a story of an oscillation of a waveform where the level increases and then it decreases and then it increases negatively and then it decreases. So having activity over here is the crossover. This is where the, the, the polarity of the waveform crosses over. And so having that there is that's why it's called crossover distortion. Cool shit, huh? So all of that's going into Vokodex. Good God. Now Vokodex is doing some stuff, but it's not doing as much as the usual Vokodex kind of thing is doing. Um, I'm automating the bandwidth. Which is having a big a big a big impact on on that kind of thing. The pitch is moving down a little bit, but like the, the real killers here are what the, the specific bandwidth shape is accomplishing. And then also a little bit on what the pitch is doing. So like these two windows represent these parameters, bandwidth and the pitch, but on a per band basis. So watch what happens when I move it around. <laughs> That's um, this this effect here of it being that these big points and the big troughs is actually pretty similar to the effect that these holes have coming in on the modulator, where it's forcing particular parts of the bands to be wider or, or thinner, but in a profile that elicits a formant uh, a formant change, which is what these kind of peaky businesses in the spectral setting do, which is quite interesting. Um, I have a little bit of the high pass, like the high pass uh, modulator coming through, and then the low pass carrier coming through, just to kind of like make the high and low end make a little bit more sense. So that's that. That's why that's there. It sounds pretty bad right now, but that's because. Oh wait, wait, one more thing. Uh, in the band distribution window, I'm doing this whole thing, which this window controls how the bands are spaced. So like, if I didn't, if I hadn't changed it at all. The bands will be linearly spaced. You might be thinking that sounds a lot more like the vocoder you're used to hearing, and that's because um, if you see up here, where we look at the um, the the frequency chart, you can see here it's like it's like 20, 50, 100, whatever. Like the density of frequencies increases upwards when it when it comes to the ways that it's distributed here. So you can see that the same space that represents 5K, 10K is the same space that represents 100 to 200. So this is 100 hertz and this is 5,000 hertz. This, this is quite, that's like, you know, that's pretty regular. That's how like an EQ works. Now this is called octave spacing, where, um, well, I'm sure it has a more eloquent name, but basically what's happening is that the distribution of harmonics is even towards octaves, which means that like, so like 50 to 100, that's one octave, 100 to 200, that's also an octave. And then like 200 to 400 would be an octave, 500 to 1,000 is an octave. Like the because every time you double a frequency, you increase it by one octave musically. So this is spaced according to octaves to give even distribution to octaves. Um, however, with that in mind, uh, if we go back to the regular, I mean, it's already here. So look at this. And a linear distribution of bands means that the space that a band represent up here actually encompasses more frequencies than the space that a band exists down here. And that creates that kind of phasery, weirdly, um, like that, that, that vocoded sound that whenever anyone opens up a vocal and doesn't do much with it, they hear that sort of result and they go, Bleh. that's uh, what that is. So this, this business, if I do that, this actually forces the like, the bands to, to essentially be more on the high end. This graph is really confusing. Like it's it's hard to sort of get what it's doing, but um, because it, it plays it and it shows you the bands linearly, even though it's not linear anymore. Because if we come back over here, 
We can see that there are fewer bands on the lower frequencies and more bands on the higher frequencies, which actually puts this closer to being distributed according to Hertz values, where like if a band down here represented like 100 Hertz, then a band up here is also going to represent 100 Hertz, and thus you'd have more bands up here. This isn't perfect because that's not, you know, I have, I don't know what the calculation of that means, but um, that's what that's accomplishing. And it helps it helps the vocoder to sound more natural because the sort of the holes that are being created when the bands thin out are more evenly distributed according to what a hertz, like a harmonic hertz value, not, not, not a harmonic value, a hertz value, because a harmonic value would be the octave value. Like that, well, the harmonics that are being showed up there, like they're, and there's more of them like on per octaves, like I'm really screwing up how to explain this. Um, the distribution is more musical in the way that we understand it, the way that we are expecting to hear it, versus if we did it like uh, even even according to octave, which is what like the 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 view is giving us here, that that's not even according to harmonics, or, uh, hertz levels, like frequency values rather, and that creates that sort of hole in the sound kind of sound. Boy, I really feel I feel like you got the point, and I apologize if I confused you because boy, that was stupid. Um, yeah, so that was that. That's these two guys, and now the next thing is I have a band pass and a notch. Just one notch and just one band pass. So back over in the automation. Um, here's the bandwidth uh, automation for for this guy. I'm gonna I'm gonna detach this so that I, I can click on things. So here's the the, the uh, this is the bandwidth for the Vocodex I mentioned earlier. Um, a lot of those like really like throaty transitions are because of that. That's a big that's a big part of that, and we'll go over that when we kind of go over the animation stack. Um, this is the bandpass frequency here, and then this is the notch down here. Or is this the bandpass? Yeah, this is the bandpass, this is the notch, and this is that high pass I mentioned earlier. I forgot to point out when the when the automation was occurring. This is the high pass automation, and this is the bandpass, and that's that. Now, this is kind of interesting, because when I normally do, like, the bandpass, uh, the, the high pass automation into a, a Vocodex kind of thing, like, that's the modulation. That's the, um... That's the rhythm that's being created. Normally, when I do, and then also when I do the bandpass thing, that's the rhythm that's being created. Now, they're not entirely apart from each other, but you can see they're not really aligned perfectly. And I wasn't really totally sure how that was going to work out, but it worked out pretty okay. And that's going into a, a Maximus. Which is um, doing a whole bunch of crap. It's basically like crushing the low mids and the highs. The highs a lot, and this is basically to like to kind of fill it out again after like all the crazy spectral shenanigans we've, we've created. And like you don't need to worry too much about like what compression does and what's happening here, or multi band compression or anything. To just get that like when Maximus does this, it's saying that like if there's like even a little bit of activity happening in the low end, it'll be brought up and stuck at zero dB. Same thing with the mids. Same thing with the highs. More so with the highs because there were less highs really. And that's also why I came in here and brought up, brought up the high pass modulator in here, just so that we can have some high frequencies back. Because a pretty common thing that occurs with Vocodex is that it'll kind of kill off the uh, higher frequency harmonics. Um, so the, the 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 compression on the high end is sort of z zeroed in to sort of handle that. There's a bit of a low cut because some of the low end is just garbage. And then uh, the master, it's not completely limiting, but I'm using the soft saturation in a pretty big way. Normally, I keep it pretty like tight. But I actually wanted like the crushed range to kind of come in, and then the compression itself is also pretty fast. Like if I didn't have soft saturation on and I didn't compress it at all on the master, like that's the activity that it kind of would be normally peak wise. So a little bit of compression, and then here's where the soft saturation. It's keeping it gracefully below zero dB. Doesn't need to be maxed out though, because that's what's happening. That's what's going to happen in this limiter over here. Uh, the next step was for, was for it to be high pass and EQ'd a bit, and then the sub to be replaced by this guy over here. So this is just a Citrus with a sine wave that has a little bit of harmonic activity in it, and the, and then something interesting happened over here with this low pass filter. A big problem that I have when I, when I did the whole sub separation thing is to have the sub kind of react the same way that like the rhythm of a sound would do and especially for this sound which has extremely complex sort of rhythmic potential based on the high pass and band pass the notch even the, the bandwidth even and then the rest of the automation that's kind of contributing it to moving a lot um what i decided to do was put a low pass filter on the sub which you might be thinking well what's it gonna pass because almost nothing is happening that's what's happening 
because of the slight distortion I'm doing on the sine wave, which you could do with the tension knob up here, fader, I guess, um, there's a, bunch, there's a couple of hardware activities. So I made, I linked this low pass filter to the band pass uh, envelope, which is this guy here. So that like when it moved, so with this guy, and you can hear that it does have an effect on those, those couple harmonics. And really what I wanted that to do is for it to sort of just, uh, just like jostle the, uh, the harmonic content of, of the sub so that it kind of fit a little better with the uh, regular stuff. And then it goes all into a limiter, which is just keeping it kind of in line. It's just compressing it. That's really all it's doing is just being a limiter. And that's the actual sound design portion of it. But let's talk about, let's talk about the animation, the automation. I call it the animation. Now, I mentioned before the first, the first five, and then the, these guys. These are the, these represent the two citruses. In fact, let's like actually dual divider here, so we can kind of see what's happening. All right. Yes. And then this is Vocadex. This is the high pass filter that goes before Vocadex. Let's put that there and put this here. And then here's Vocadex. And then here's uh, Bandpass and Notch. Actually, that's, that's Notch. And this is Bandpass. So Bandpass and Notch does the same deals there. Nice. All right, cool. Now we can more visually kind of tell what's happening. Actually, let's zoom in a bit. All right. Now, what there are some changes that I made deliberately, but in the, in the initial art, like articulation of these parameters, I really just put them down randomly, and I was kind of looking at what activity occurred, and then sort of you know just as necessary. However, I didn't do any of this bit at all until I had created the the Vocodex portion of it because I would I didn't know how any of this was gonna, was gonna um like behave until I hear it together. Uh, this guy like this guy didn't get must around move around too much, but what happened is like this guy. And then, like over here, had such cool things happening that I basically really paid very close attention to what was going on. And like this is what I mentioned before about the bandwidth sort of causing these things to happen. And let's see if because if I move the bandwidth to be thicker, you can hear it still doing it, but not quite as hardcore. And there's also the 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 uh, high pass that's playing a big part of it. And then there's the band pass itself. And then the notch that moves through it. So like these three things are like a huge part of the actual like the primary formant articulation, the thing that's making the sound do what we kind of hear it doing. Like everything that happens before it is, is a pretty big sort of textural discussion about what it's gonna do. Some parts of it matter more than others. Like this guy. Uh, it's not totally apparent at the moment, but let's see this over here. Oh, I get it because it's dirt because it's positive negative, so the effects are similar when it's all the way off. Because off isn't actually off. Remember that this is this is a negative one hundred to positive one hundred and zeros in the center. So like off off would be down here. So there's there is quite a bit of difference, you know, for that for that particular portion. Um, and the other operators, I mean, they, they, if you turn them off, you'll hear that they they don't they'll they'll stop doing what they're doing, but. Um, the, the primary modulation are the things that happen near the end of things, especially the bandpass and the notch, because that's like that, that's like the last real like filtered step there. Oh boy, am I glad I don't have the yellow filter anymore? Oh, you guys don't know about that yet because you haven't seen the the episode of Collab Alliance that I recorded. Ha <laughs> ha, that's coming soon. Don't worry, because I have recorded. I'm just having some technical difficulties with uh, other videos, so that it's all consistent. And it's really just kind of dumb, and it's mostly my fault, but it's okay. Anyway, oh yeah, uh, last but not least is sort of what the MIDI's doing. In terms of specific modulation, like I, I have had the pitch coming off really hard on here, like with the, the um, slide notes. And this guy is just a standalone note. But it's also like, it would be different if I were to do this. And that's because of the unison. It's extremely subtle, but did I turn unison back on? Yeah. 
the unison uh, makes the notes move as you pl as you play them. As opposed to being static if all of them are off. So holding the note will change the modulation a little bit. The unison is slight. The parameters themselves aren't terribly like dense. Pitch and phase are pretty low. Like it's mostly just panning that's kind of doing the important parts. And it's just keeping it, which is just mostly keeping it panned. Uh, not that one anyway, which this one, by the way, remember, this is the modulator. And that's important because uh, it's interesting. Like it's interesting to note that like Vocodex can it's doing all of these things in stereo. So like when it like when this guy, which is a mono signal, encounters differences in the modulators left and right, it comes out a stereo signal. So this guy doesn't have to be panned for it to be panned. <laughs> Which doesn't mean that you can't pan it and it doesn't sound cool when it is panned. But there is a particular value to, especially when you're doing stuff in a distortion, for having things centered if you have multiple voices. And that's because if you don't have them centered, that means that they're going to be they're going to be processed in stereo. You might be thinking, well, derp, what's wrong with that? Well, the more the thing is spread, that means the more that the processing is being either the left or the right and not wholly together which means that the pro the profile of them being crushed together aren't going to be all five voices, but like some, like, you know, ha like these two voices over, over on, the le on the right and these two voices on the left, and then they'll get crushed together, but it's not going to be all five voices and them being crushed together, which when they're perfectly mono, there's quite a bit of a difference to that, um, which can be a unique experiment for later to, to sort of flesh out that, that concept. Did I get rid of... I want to get rid of that. And I didn't do that over here, did I? Nope. <laughs> Oh good, I didn't ruin it. Uh, what I did there was I got rid of the attack on the master the, the master limiter and the LMH delay, which this button, or rather this knob and this knob, do the same thing, except that this knob does what this knob does for the low mid and high, hence being called LMH delay. Attack also delays, but at the low mid and high, the attack does what attack's supposed to do, which just, come on guys. But, um... Same deal on the limiter. The attack delays the audio, and I'm not do I'm not doing anything that necessi necessitates me doing that. So I'm just don't want it don't want it there because it does delay the audio and like and it, the amount that you change it. So like this is this is set to 25 milliseconds. It'll delay it 25 milliseconds, which could kind of pay in the butt if you want your stuff to be synced properly. Uh, yeah. Ooh, this is a doozy. But this patch will be available for download in the description of this video. If you have any questions about this, please let me know. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and all that good stuff. And as usual, have a nice day.